Hello, good afternoon and welcome. You're all very welcome to um, this afternoon's IT at Cork workshop, which is brought to you in association with Dave Clark from Clark Analytics. So um, this afternoon's topic um, on data literacy um, is such an important and an evolving one. Um, it's all about how you can build a data literacy and a data driven culture in your organization um, and I think this workshop will be relevant to so many businesses because um, the whole area of data analytics and data, data science uh, is in many cases is viewed as a nice to have or an area that you will get to um, at, a, at a later point in time but in many ways now is the time to seriously look at data analytics in your business as a tool for competitiveness and for productivity. So um, a key theme for this week's um, tech festival, for those of you that have been dialing in through the week, you will, you will probably have seen this is digital transformation and the rate of digital transformation, um, how it has been expedited at, at an extraordinary rate really. Um, and data and data analy analytics is a key component of, of this digital transformation. So just by way of introduction, uh, my name is Ona Mahoney and I am the Cluster Manager for IT at Cork. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here this afternoon. Thanks for dialing in. Um, this workshop um, is brought to you, as I said, as part of our Tech Fest. We're on day five of our Tech Fest. So we've had a lot of webinars, a lot of workshops throughout the week. Uh, as I said, thanks for those of you who have taken the time to dial in uh, and I hope you've got some useful insights from them. Um, so this afternoon, after this workshop, we're finishing with uh, a very exciting one-to-one um, -one interview with uh, uh, Liam Casey, founder and CEO of, of PCH, of course, who needs no introduction. Um, still getting some inquiries about tickets to dial into this. There are still tickets available for IT Cork members. If you want to email in the next hour, admin at itcork.ie. Big thank you and shout out to our event uh, sponsor and promoter throughout the week, IT at Cork Skillnet. Um, they've been a great support um, for this tech festival th throughout the week. To found, find out a little bit more about IT at Cork Skillnet, um, the types of courses that they run um, and, and, and the types of upskilling programs, you can just go to our website, itcork.ie, or you can contact um, our program manager, Annette Cor Coburn, on skillnet at itcork.ie. Okay, so just finally some useful tips uh, for those of you dialed in to get the most out of this workshop. Uh, this workshop is being recorded and it will be made available on our YouTube channel in the next week or so. And I know that's, um, that's very useful if you wanna go back and, and reference some of the tips and advice. So uh, just, just keep an eye out on our website. It will be up there in the next week or so. 
There is also, we encourage people uh, to use the Q&A tab um, to ask questions for Dave. Um, ask questions throughout, um, uh, but we'll probably get to the Q&A around 2.45, so we'll just let uh, Dave get through his, his presentation first. So um, that brings us on to, to the main act, um, Dave Clark. Um, hello, Dave, I'm going to ask you to turn on your, your video now. And you're very welcome. And I must say, Hi, Dave, Hi, IT Dave, Cork. Dave, Hi, everybody. Gets the, Dave gets the award for the um, most impressive um, backdrop um, and the best uh, brand product placing that, that we've seen throughout the week. And yeah, and he's even show, showcasing the Cork colors there. So um, thumbs, up to, thumbs up to Dave for that. So listen, without uh, further wait, I'm going to hand you over to Dave now. Thank you. Go for it, Dave. We seem to have lost Dave. Dave, can you hear? Um, is that data analytics? This is number uh, people. Uh, people would see. Am I sharing? Yeah, you're good, Dave. Yeah, yeah we're good. Okay. So, uh, let me just go back there. So, um, people who follow me on LinkedIn would probably would have seen uh, me releasing a, a sort of program of data literacy courses. And, um, and I noted there, data analytics doesn't appear on the actual title of this presentation. Um, because more and more, um, it's been seen now, it's skill sets in data literacy is really what needs to be uh, engendered and created and, and developed by organizations. And data literacy, to me, uh, is, is a little bit wider than just data analytics. Data analytics uh, tended to, to uh, be very much in the data mining, applying algorithms and uh, applying the results of those algorithms. But data literacy is really about using data analytics to tell the story that's, um, that's understandable by the business to help answer the business question. Um, so that's sort of where, where data literacy uh, comes into play. Um, I give a little bit of background on myself, uh, just to introduce myself. Um, uh, I'm 25 years plus in the data space. Um, I would have started out my primary degree was in applied mathematics and computing, which um, there's quite a few data scientists that I know working in, in even in the Munster region, uh, who came out of that course. Fundamentally, it was a data science course. Uh, and uh, I've been working um, in the space, as I said, for the last 25 years. A big stint of that was in, in EMC, the data storage company, a lot of data companies. Um, in October 2016, myself and my, my, my lovely wife, Helen, uh, set up Clark Analytics. Um, and uh, the, the data literacy courses that, that we've been releasing uh, over the last week and, and some more next week, um, they are taking a lot of the best practices that I've, I've sort of uh, come to in terms of lessons learned in those projects uh, since starting Clark Analytics. Um, and we've worked with, I suppose, between three to six customers per year in various different areas, life sciences, biopharma, manufacturing, finance, retail. Um, so I've taken a lot of that and I've really been thinking about, uh, you know, what are the, the sort of the key um, the key things and, and frameworks of understanding, the key understandings that are needed in order to, for companies to develop their overall uh, data literacy. Um, and those key understandings that organizations need to develop and, and in some er earlier presentations uh, by, by Colin and uh, Siobhan and Enda Cummings earlier today, uh, were started to talk about this, you know, what are the key skills that are needed? So the key understanding for me is, is one understanding of the business context. Um, you know, what business are you in? Uh, why do you need data in your business? Um, and then there's understanding the data architecture context. The data architecture context is a little bit more than just data, understanding what data you need to answer the business question. Um, so the data architecture is really where data is stored, how it's stored, um, you know, what types of data are needed, and it's a bit more sort of all-encompassing a little bit. Um, and the fun, the interesting thing about these and part of the challenge I think that organizations have is that these two understandings uh, sit in different parts of the organization. The business context understanding sits with the business side. The data architecture context 
for a large extent of the time, usually sits in the IT uh, team. So the, and that's a challenge. Uh, why we would have heard earlier today this idea around collaboration being so important. And fundamentally, the understanding of the data value context comes from having a strong, uh, uh, well-managed, agile uh, methodology that actually um, helps in that collaboration between the business and data architecture and the, and the IT teams. Um, I know you'll see here as well, there's a lot of interdependencies between each of these. So one of the challenges when you come about uh, actually trying to build a course, a training course for people, so, you know, where do we start? And you would have heard that uh, as well throughout the week. And you know, it's, 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 it's that part of the difficulty is for people to really understand, well, where do I start doing this, right? So one of the things that we're doing in our, in our training courses is to put forward this developmental framework. Um, and it's, it's sort of inspired by Henry Mintzberg, who's a famous organizational theorist. Um, and, you know, Mintzberg's idea is that if you want organizational transformational change, which is sort of what we're doing right now, um, is that you need to, um, you need to address all parts of, the, of your organizational change cube, not just one part. Uh, so if you change one part, you'll get maybe iterative change. But if you're looking for transformational change, you need to address all parts of the cube. So you'll see there in the top, you know, you may have specifically business initiatives and usually they are, you know, it's, it's more growth, uh, it's productivity gain, gains or operational efficiency gains, or maybe there is some financial risk. Um, and, and, you know, I, other times I described this as sort of, there's a top-down approach to data literacy development and maturity, there's a bottom-up approach. The top-down is really from the business. Um, the bottom-up approach means the level of collaboration needs to be there. You need to have put together projects and people with specific skills and use a different methodology. And the yellow bit there is those blocks are when you start looking at the technical side. Of it. Um, but there's a big business and people and process side of it. The technical side of it, although it's important, is that people and process side of it is very, very important as well. Um, and obviously, all of this now, more than ever, needs to be managed in a, a data governed approach. Um, so you need to, um, you know, a data governance two or three years ago, people thought it was all about GDPR. Um, but in fact, now added to that, um, you know, you have ethics and trustworthy AI and, and data security and security models. And all of that is important as well. Um, so, so so, so certainly when, when, when we were putting together a program of courses, we used this framework as a way um, to, to put a roadmap in place for organizations to be able to increase the overall data literacy. Uh, now you'll see noted there in the bottom right, it's maturity level, you know, the bigger the cube, the more mature you are. And various organizations, especially in the IT realm, will have uh, maturity models that they use. Um, and, and, and that's all fine, and, and this framework uh, work can work with any one of those models. Uh, as part of our training, we put together our own uh, data literacy maturity assessment, which is freely available uh, to, to our course attendees. Um, but it sort of looks at organizational change. And, and this, this um, approach can be very good as to start the conversation. Um, people need, you need to, uh, organizations need to start uh, understanding their level of, of maturity in terms of data literacy. You only need to understand where they are right now, and they need to have targets in place as to where they're going to get to in the next year, the next two years, and three years. Um, and an interesting thing of this, I think there is uh, behind this is between 30 and 40 questions that people answer in a sort of Lerkert scale of one to five, one being you know minimal maturity level, five being maximum. Um, and the questions cover things like data maturity, you know, business data strategy maturity people in process. And the interesting point here, and this is for data literacy, uh, is that the technical aspects of it are just two of the six uh, corners or vertex of the overall maturity, two of the six blocks. Um, and the rest are more the people and, prospect, uh, people and process aspects of data literacy maturity. So this can be a very good uh, tool in order to um, start the conversation in the organization, in your organization around data literacy, 
uh, what are the where are the places, places where we're lacking? You know, what parts of the development framework cube do we need to add to so that we can actually uh, increase our overall data, data, data literacy maturity? So let's get back to those three fundamental understandings. And the first one was understanding the business context. So um, understanding the business context, I suppose the first thing is you need to know what business you're in. Um, it's clear enough to say that. Uh, and in Clark Analytics, we, we worked at, I worked at all of these sort of different areas. And I suppose my first uh, nugget of information, a nugget of, of uh, there's lots of different questions here. You know, pharma, they were talking about improving yield. Um, and certainly that's, that's, that's a, 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 an important question. Um, but in terms of, you know, what I look for. So what I look for when people come to us and say, yeah, can you help us answer this question? Is, um, is there pain? So is there pain? Is the organization actually um, uh, in pain because they can't answer this question? So take, for example, I'm doing some work, investigative type work with a biopharma company right now. They're looking to see the opportunity uh, to increase product yield, uh, protein extraction levels. Um, and can they increase those because they uh, get, get through more batches, more quality, more product. Um, but one of the key people that I'm working with in terms of the manufacturing execution side uh, is, uh, you know, it's not a pain point for him. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, everything is within control limits as set out with their FDA, FDA uh, regulations. So, you know, what's his need for change isn't there. Whereas I've also worked with another company in the medical device realms who were blowing their scrap budget uh, by 300%. Now that's a pain point. And that's somebody's, that's somebody's pain. Um, if you look at healthcare, right? So, you know, we need needing to understand whether a disease is slowing in growth. That's a pain point at the moment, I think. Um, and it's great to see, you know, uh, an aspiring data scientist in George Lee uh, really getting into the numbers and, and helping us to understand growth rate and exponential growth and all this sort of good stuff. Uh, uh, you know, a budding data scientist there. But there's a pain point. So you could say that there, we are successfully applying data there to answer that business question. And in the public sector, you know, the need to predict state of exam results. Again, pressing pain point, I guess, for the 70 to 80 odd Leibniz students. How successful that was though, um, you know, is, is probably up for discussion. I would proffer that it wasn't a problem with the data science part of it, but maybe in the communication and the data literacy side of that and the communication of how results have come, came out with. Uh, and so maybe some maturity levels there in terms of the management and overall uh, human oversight, um, which is a big part of trustworthy AI as well, uh, may have been lacking in, in that, that sense. The other side of uh, this and there's the next um, uh, nugget of, of, of best practice is you know the business question is the pain point but pain is suffered by a person so you need to in a data analysis you need to try and get to who has the pain point uh, and who ultimately is going to be your business sponsor and sponsorship um, where in a lot of projects sometimes people sort of um, and they, they, they don't fully appreciate the level of strong sponsorship or how a good sponsor affects a project. But um, in data analytics, it is so important. And it's so important because of that collaboration need. Right? So you're going to, data projects usually will, will span across different business, uh, different business groups, different business organizations, different organizations within uh, a company. And so, uh, getting the right sponsorship is so well. Somebody who's strong and supported um, and, and, and seen in the good light and had the power to work across multiple organizations. Um, the CFO is another very, very important person to have um, because, you know, they know where the money is locked in the organization. And that can be a very, very good uh, person uh, to have involved in any data analytics project as well. Because ultimately, uh, if you look at the CEO, obviously, it's probably the, 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 the best sponsor. And there, um, as, as a good uh, colleague of mine, old friend, uh, Bill Schmarzo, the Dean of Big Data, talks about, you know, the make more money. Uh, and that's, that's, that's the key sort of business uh, question to answer. How do I make more money? Sometimes it's, uh, how do I find more money? 
and that's my experience, the free cash flow generation opportunities, for example, in the bloated supply chain, who your CFO will know, and they'll know about that, that could be a very good place to start because the important thing about uh, data analytics projects is, is actually getting success and getting success early. Uh, so that's a, uh, a good, a good some, some good examples of, of places to start in my experience. The other um, thing that's important uh, that I have seen is getting the right business question. So uh, people will have seen these types of, of uh, brainstorming type techniques. You get everybody in a room that's important to the problem. You put down lots of different uh, possible goals, possible questions, and then you do this prioritization uh, efforts where you look at each particular uh, uh, idea that was come up with and you, you mark them off against the business value versus implementation feasibility. Now, my, my, my one um, recommendation here is that you pick something that, um, you know, is, is, is actually going to, uh, you pick, pick one, maybe two, um, um, ideas to go for, and one is usually best. One that has a pain point, you've got a good sponsor, right, and it is implementable in a short time frame. Um, because sometimes what happens is that you will get lots of different uh, questions, and maybe people are, have got resources only for a short period of time, so they go after all of them, um, and they'll usually, in my experience, end up in this zone of, of user disillusionment where maybe they've only been able to answer half of the question in a short time frame and weren't able to answer the rest of the questions and people are sort of looking at each other and goes, well, was that actually unaffected? Whereas, you know, if you really get to the right question um, and it's a pain point and you can answer it quickly, they're seen as more successful. And the reason why that's a good idea to do that is that building your overall data literacy maturity it's very important to get your quick wins. It's very important to get to be able to achieve something with data to add the business value. And so zeroing in the pain point with the right sponsor um, with, with, with a data question that's achievable to answer in with the data is so important. So I'll give you an example. Um, this is a very successful project that we did last year with a drinks manufacturer. Um, and they had a very specific pain point. Um, so they were hearing complaints from customers across the country, various different parts, um, and they would have a, a good customer, let's say in town A, and that customer would say, listen, you know, Johnny across the road is also a customer of yours, and I know I actually buy more product from you than that customer, but you only deliver to me, you know, every two or three weeks, whereas he gets a delivery every week, and I'm peed off, and, you know, you're not servicing me as a client. And this company, one of their big KPIs, key performance indexes, is customer satisfaction. So their head of sales came to us and said, Dave, uh, what's, what's up here? And, I, and they weren't able to, to and they, you know, their current, they had a brilliant data analytics team, um, but they were tied up with other things and uh, difficult to get to the number of that particular question. So um, we went in, we did a three week piece of work and we were able to come back with them. We did proximity analysis of all of their customers, how much they were buying, how close they were to each other. We were able to give them a list of customers within one kilometer and five kilometers of each other where one cl client was ordering more, st more stock and would get delivered to at less, uh, less, less frequency. Um, and so that was a three week piece of work done over a number of months. Uh, but it, it answered the question to a pain point that a head person, a strong sponsor had. Uh, and there was other good things I think that actually helped in that was that there was very good collaboration um, in the organization, which helped as well. Very good, strong analytics team that needed some extra help um, and really good collaborative uh, and, and relationship from the business and the IT team. So we understand the business context, we have the sponsor, we have the business question, right? So understanding the data architecture. Um, now, this is something that we cover quite a lot in our, in our training courses. And I'm gonna talk a little bit around that and then we show um, uh, an example of some work we've done with a biopharma company in, in this space. 
Um, so in terms of data architecture um, and, and the, uh, I suppose the systems that are needed to give the data insights to the, the uh, organizations and to the business. Um, there's, a, there's a piece of work that's been done with a company called Greylock Partners. Um, they're a UK consultancy company and they have, they, they put forward this idea of the new modes. So we've heard of data lakes, um, uh, data swamps, some people have, have, have called them uh, if they're not governed very well. Um, so uh, Greylock Partners, this, they put forward this idea of the new modes and modes are defense mechanisms. So um, companies across the globe who do not um, really take on um, uh, data, data literacy and, and data transformations are at risk of having their business models eroded. So Greylock put forward this idea that is that the systems of intelligence that you have are your new moats to business model erosion. Um, so those systems of intelligence, they sit between your systems of record and your systems of engagement. So the systems of engagement are, you know, your website, your mobile app, you know, your, your, your chat, whatever it is, is the front end presentation layer of a system that you use on a day to day basis to get the information you need to make your business decision. There's systems of engagement. The systems of record um, and the systems of record that, that Greylock uh, point to are like your ERP, your CRM, your headcount management systems, your IT service management systems. Um, for me, they're IT systems. Uh, I would add the OT systems um, that, uh, that Siobhan and Colin would have talked about earlier today, and you find them in a lot of biopharma companies, your Scala uh, distributed control systems, your historians, your, your lab information management systems, your, your manufacturing execution systems, and add to that then your IoT. So these are all of your source systems. Uh, and from a data architectural perspective, you need to understand those different architectures and where they sit. But from a data analytics slash literacy perspective, you need to be concentrating and focusing on your systems of intelligence, which will take all that data and basically build the story that will basically answer the question being asked uh, and will, will, will give that answer to the systems of engagement. Now, systems of intelligence have two layers. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the layer that the, the data science people are interested in is the analytics layer. Right? Uh, and, you know, in the analytics layer, um, you're looking at facts of things that have happened in the past, um, you know, using your descriptive analytics or business intelligence type solutions. That's sort of seen as hindsight. But you're using that data in the past to maybe predict, have insight into what will happen. You're using your predictive analytics maybe to, to do trending and to forecasting and whatnot. Um, you may use diagnostic analytics to maybe look into what happened in the past to see a little bit why it might have happened in that way. And then you're moving into the more advanced, you know, uh, using foresight to, to apply things like your prescriptive analytics or quite advanced cognitive analytics and uh, to really be able to give, you know, next best action uh, to the business user uh, looking at data through systems of engagement. Now, all of this in terms of systems of intelligence, the data layer components are probably 20% of the overall effort because underneath that effort there and, and, and the data sets that the analytics layer get, you know, need to be cleaned, need to be structured so that the algorithms can work. Underneath all of that is the data layer complexity. And this is where 80% of the challenges lie. Um, now, it doesn't necessarily need to be. You know, it doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily, the data architecture to answer business question may be quite simple. There on the left, you may be getting data directly from your systems of record uh, and presenting that to your analytics layer, which will run lots of algorithms and be great. Right? Um, and that has happened, for example, in that drinks company, you know, was able to get specific data from specific places, be able to do something very, very quickly, which is good. Um, you know, adding to the old data literacy maturity. But, the drivers then, the challenge comes when you need to move data to another, another site. Now, the ultimate of that, which um, you would have heard about this morning, is you're going it onto a data lake. Uh, data lake, data platform, it's going up in the cloud. It's, it's you know, the, 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 the attributes of big data, like the volume, velocity, variety, 
are those sort of drivers that that, make, that, that force you to make that move up onto, onto the bigger platforms. Um, there is a space in between, which is data virtualization. Um, but one of the challenges that biopharma people will have in terms of the data lake is second copies of data. Uh, and if you're from a biopharma background, you'll know of things like 21 CFR Part 11, FDA regulations, data integrity, second copies of data normally and biopharma people that I talk to aren't great. So the data virtualization is another uh, approach. Um, data virtualization, basically, um, you still, you're just taking data from the sources. It's kept in memory, uh, uh, pre-queried, uh, pre, pre, pre um, uh, parallel uh, query optimized, held in memory, ready for the analytics layer when it comes to actually look for the data. Um, an example of that, this is a piece of work that we've that I've done recently with a biopharma company that basically wanted that sort of end-to-end -end data, vis data visibility across their systems of record in terms of their, their um, ERP systems, but also across their MES and their OSI Pi and their LIMS and their other systems. Uh, and so, um, and, and, and their overall requirement for that end-to-end -end data visibility is that they wanted to move towards a, a having a a control tower type solution that would support continuous process verification. So, um, so, so I proposed this design where uh, one of the things about biopharma is that, and I think Colin might have mentioned it earlier today, is that it's not the billions and billions of records. And those billions and billions and if you've got millions of transactions, straight away I would say, yeah, you probably need to go to a data lake. Uh, you, need to, you need to have it outside of, of your current environment. Um, uh, so that you can run the heavy processing there. Um, but data virtualization has actually got a sweet spot in the biopharma companies because um, they generally tend to be, rather than billions of records, it's thousands of variables, but not many batches of records, maybe a couple of thousand. Um, so it opens itself up for that. And this particular client, they just recently completed a pilot, technical pilot, and they've been able to access their ERP systems and their OSI Pi systems. Um, it's managed in the data layer, which can be the IT department, they understand how to get access to all of these different data sets that can be managed there and then given over uh, as a single pane really to the analytic layer users. So, um, so that's a, a, an option there to look at. Uh, but sometimes you just need to go to a data lake uh, and a lot of complexity here, a lot of different users out there. Um, it's a, 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 an, emerging term, uh, an, emerging, an emerging area really you need to consider things like data curation, your platform management, data governance, you know, distributed architectures, MPP databases, all that sort of good stuff. Um, and again, this is 80%. It really is 80% of, of, uh, of the work, I think, in terms of getting data. But it doesn't necessarily, not all data um, projects need to go to the data lake. A lot of them do, but some don't. And I think the, there is an importance in terms of managing these projects uh, that you understand and uh, certainly can, can build expectation manager with your project sponsor in order to understand just how much data is going to be needed and to answer that particular business question. So, so we've talked about um, the business understanding, a key understanding needed there. We've talked about the data architecture uh, understanding and I think the, the, the bit that, that melds all that together, the bit, the understanding the data value is about understanding, you know, does the data that you have access to actually answer the business question that you're looking to answer? Uh, and so um, this is a methodology, and I've written about this on, on LinkedIn, and we walk through this in our, in our data literacy courses. Uh, it's a, it's a, I've taken the CRISPM uh, and I've sort of built them into very specific services uh, that, that customers can, can can take on a piecemeal sort of basis. Um, and the first one really is that understanding the business need. Uh, I know we, we run innovation workshops with our customers and it's important that that's where the collaboration starts. The innovation workshop should have business people. It should have uh, data people, IT people. It should have the sponsor. Um, it should be properly project managed. Project management is so important here because project management, you know, 80% project management, and I've been a project manager uh, for a good part of my career, 80% of that is basically managing the expectations of your sponsor or your customer. Um, and 
it is very important here because um, this article that talks about you know the five rights, the right question, right process, right team, right tools, the right answer, there's two types of right answer. One type of right answer is you actually get the answer to the question you were looking for. You know, what lever do I pull in my organization in order to increase my product needs, increase my, my uh, uh, scrappage levels? You actually get to the answer of something that can be used in the business to actually drive the business forward. The other right answer is that you don't find what you were looking for. Yeah, interesting. Well, the reason for that is you're still increasing, you're actually learning more about your organization. You're learning more about the data you have access to. You're learning more about your business question. Now, maybe your business question actually isn't the right question at all. Right? Or maybe the business question cannot be answered with the data you have access to. So, and you've only found that out. And if that's the case, I would say, yeah, what's most likely happening here is that your business is not really in tune with your data organization, with your IT organization, right? So um, this is important to get to this quickly, which is why you do the test value quickly, you know, which is why, you know, that previous example that we had in the, uh, with, with, with the drinks company, we did it with three weeks of effort. Now it took a little bit longer because I was waiting for data uh, a little bit, but the idea is to run through this as quickly as possible so that you get your quick wins and you start to build your organizational uh, capability and overall uh, data literacy maturity. Uh, and then you can build that. That's just one, one particular project. And for every project, you should actually do it this way. You should build in then a programmatic approach. So where you may have got one value by looking at data, one part of a supply chain, uh, or one part of your product life cycle, if you're in the biopharma. If you run lots of projects and you, you have a programmatic approach to it, then that gives the opportunity to maybe have some failures in workshops, right? Where you do a workshop, everybody can say, well, you know, there's, there's no value there and people can you know it's not work going forward. But keep doing them, right? Keep coming, there's, there's an infinite, infinite number of possible questions that could be answered with data. You just need to have a, a very clear way of asking the question, finding out if the data answers it, and if it answers it, great. If it doesn't answer it, also great, move on, ask another question, right? And in that way, then you build your overall data analytics maturity, and that's very important. So uh, I think it was, it was an end uh, today, talked about, you know, uh, the make uh, Six Sigma, uh, as, as a methodology. And there is an opportunity here to combine methodologies. So, so, so this is some work that uh, I do with a partner of ours, uh, Crest Solutions, also work-based. Um, and we're working with a biopharma company where uh, we're actually taking the Six Sigma methodology and the, the, the CRISP uh, uh, methodology of data mining and sort of combining them. Because one of the challenges that people have with Lean Six Sigma is that uh, you know, the, the horse has bolted, you know, the problem has happened. Um, and now you're going to use the make uh, to actually find the root cause of the problem, uh, come up with uh, a design of experiments to actually put in place new methods to actually fix the problem going forward. Whereas in fact, what the, man where the management, where the sp possible sponsors and a lot of these companies want is they want to know the problem is coming before it actually arrives. Um, so, uh, you know, there is an opportunity to, you know, combine the different methodologies so that, for example, you can use CRISPDM to help find the key um, uh, metrics, the key levers in your organization that are possibly affecting quality or affecting some other key KPI in the organization. And then you can use your Lean Sigma um, to actually identify uh, the, the, the um, the particular experiment that you need to do in order to ensure that you can manage that particular uh, variable or lever in your organization so you ensure that you keep within your uh, proper operating limits. So this is another methodology. And so, so, so this is something that's happening and I think this will, this will become more of the normals and uh, certainly the biopharma uh, companies are, are looking at this and actually all manufacturing companies should be looking at this. Uh, moving forward. And this will be 
um, uh, really the, the way in which companies move them forward. So um, another thing that was that was talked about a little bit of skill sets and skill needs. Um, here is a, a chart from um, McKinsey. Uh, McKinsey, great, some great work that they do in terms of that. But uh, one of the things that I find when I talk to, to clients is that, wow, uh, there's like eight different people noted here. Do I need a team of eight? Um, there certainly is a mix of skills needed. Um, in terms of your overall framework, if we're just throwing a data science in there, scientist in there is not going to be uh, the solution. Um, it's an overall organizational development in terms of your development framework for Cube. Um, but certainly the business and technology and analytics skills is, is um, skills that are needed. Uh, in Clark Analytics, we've sort of concentrated uh, and I've concentrated our own efforts very much in that analytics translators. It's that link between the business and the wider data team, um, helping to answer the questions the business have with the data that organizations have access to. Um, and in my experience, the, the sort of minimum skills that you're going to need um, are, are going to be your domain business analyst and your data scientist. Um, and they'll also need a data engineer for the larger data sets. Now, to me, uh, if we think back to um, the, the presentations earlier today, your domain business analysts are people like your Colin, uh, but also also Enda uh, from Biomarn. I would see him as, as a domain business analyst. And a good um, thing I heard once about the difference between your domain business analyst and your data scientist is that your domain business analyst understands at the minutiae level how your organization will interact with your product. So they understand all of the DNA sequences of your large molecule uh, protein. They understand that each of each of those. What the data scientist does is they bring that understanding at the minutia to, to, to billions of records or billions of molecules or hundreds of thousands of customers um, by using ways of which you can look at patterns or find patterns and lots of data uh, which, which, which are similar to the pattern of an individual. Uh, the data, data, the database engineers. I mean, there's, there's there's lots of database engineers out there, and they're all learning now the the Hadoop or the MPP databases, the cloud infrastructures, Snowflake, whatever it might be. Um, and and they're generally need once you start going into multiple multiple data sets. Um, your project manager. Um, uh, I shout out to the project managers out there. Very very important as well. Um, and obviously compliance is becoming very very important. Um, your user interface developer storyteller, some organizations have got data platforms that use uh, a lot of, of um, uh, uh, data ops type, type uh, uh, capabilities, uh, and that becomes a, a, a need there, somebody who, who has that sort of web apps development. But for a lot of cases, it's not actually needed uh, for a lot of companies, uh, certainly an issue. So, uh, last couple of slides, um, and then we, we, we'll hand over some questions. Right? So I, 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 people, as I said at the start, would have noted that I've been releasing programs of data literacy courses um, with, with some partners of ours um, at the Irish Centre for Business Excellence. Um, and the structure of the courses, um, they're all online. Um, they are, uh, take three days of effort over three weeks. Um, in the first week, there's seven um, online uh, lectures uh, of between 30 and 60 minutes. Um, the first lecture is an introductory. Uh, everybody gets online and understands, you know, gets to talk to each other. Uh, it's sort of trying to get collaboration going. Um, and then I talk through various parts of this development cube in a lot more detail than that's what's been in this presentation. Um, and then people get access to these five or six different data sets. They get a business question. They get access to Tipco Spotfire. Um, and they can actually work and start, start answering questions uh, at the end of it. And they have to present at the end uh, of, of, of the course. Uh, so it's, it's three days over three weeks. The first week is this one day of, of lectures, but they're spaced out. There's a, there are 11 and, and two, 11 and two each day, right? So it's designed so that you can do it within your work, your work week. Um, and then the data uh, exercise is part of it. Again, it's, it's, it's probably a couple of days of effort over two weeks. Um, so it's, it's very sort of achievable in that perspective. And, and it is pretty detailed. Um, you know, I go, do go through quite a bit of stuff. And, and this, 
this course has, has been designed um, from my experience in courses of this type. The important, one important thing that I, I try to put into this course is that in my experience, when business people and IT people or, or technology people go to on data literacy, data analytics courses, halfway through the course, all of the business people get left out because you start going into really deep algorithms all the way. So one of the things that I try to do in this course is one, um, you know, uh, try to use a low code, no code software package that will enable you to do all those nice things like uh, descriptive analytics, diagnostic analytics, uh, predictive analytics, and all of those, even cognitive analytics uh, and deep learning stuff, but in a point and click manner, right? So typical Spotfire, uh, typical is a great company and they've really been, been uh, I've been following them now uh, for the last while. They're really doing some great work. Um, and so, you know, one of the, the, the nice sort of feedbacks I've got from this course from business people is that, well, I was able to stick with it the whole way through. And actually now I actually feel quite confident that I can start looking at data using this too. Right? So, um, so check it out. Um, last bit of uh, shameless self-promotion uh, for a startup before we go to questions. Um, reach out to me uh, if you're interested in the course. Uh, the next one starts on October 5th. As I say, it's three days effort spread over three weeks. Um, so, so that's it. Um, I'll stop there. Um, I don't know, Owen, if we want to go, if there's been a few questions uh, that we might want to, to go at. Hopefully this has been of, of value to people. Um, no, thanks a million. That was, you covered a lot of ground there. <clears throat> Some really good stuff in, <clears throat> excuse me. So just, just a reminder to the audience, please get your questions in for Dave because we just have uh, about 10 minutes left. Um, so please get, just use the Q&A tab there. Um, maybe just to kick things off, Dave, um, mine, I, I've more of a comment really than a question, um, which I, I, I think might be very relevant to the audience that is dialed in as well. I liked the... Uh, distinguish how you distinguish between a business analyst and um, a data scientist um, and uh, I suppose many of members of ITA Cork are very much um, you know from from uh, on the industry side and Enda as you said um, is a good example that someone that works on the process side and has very much um, worked on a set of data from their process environment so I, I'm sure that um, can be applied across the board from for manufacturing companies. That whole um, the business analyst approach, um, you know, taking that taking that approach and really fro focusing on on the um, data processing side. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's it's um, and this is. I mean, I, I focused on biopharma because today was a lot about biopharma, um, but it's the same across all uh, areas where you want to apply data. There is somebody in your organization who understands how your business process generates data. And they're the people to, take, to, to lie into, the people who understand how data is generated in your ERP system. So, so they understand their interactions with a customer or how the business process creates the product. Um, and they are so important to have they're the key person to have on the data analytics team. Perfect, very good. Um, cool, there's another question in there. Uh, Dave, if I just get you to take down the presentation as well and I'll get to the next question. Um, this is from John Flannery. Hi Dave, uh, thanks for the great course. I am a tech writer and wondering if you have done any work in this space. Um, I have certainly in, in my time in EMC, um, I've worked with a lot of really great tech writers. Um, and uh, what, what some people might, might uh, you know, and it is, it, it is, it is a key uh, skill actually needed. And it's where the data analytics, which obviously have very technical backgrounds, but being able to write the story, the tech writing, being able to succinctly understand what the data is telling you to be able to communicate that is such an important skill um, and so you know that sort of communication the soft skills the tech writing skills 
project management skills. All of these skills are really where you start to expand from data analytics to data literacy. So it's a really great question. And uh, yeah, so hopefully that's, that's the sort of answer. Um, just as we're waiting, um, if there's any other questions coming in. Uh, from an SME um, and, and a startup perspective, um, you know, at the earlier stage, they probably don't have the huge data sets built up, um, but I'm sure, um, you know, data analytics is, is, is relevant to companies at all stages of growth. What advice would you have for um, companies at the earlier stage of development, startups and SMEs? Yeah, so um, I think startups and SMEs probably won't. Obviously, as you said, they won't have, let's say, data sets on their, on their customers. Uh, and in fact, one of the probably most used uh, data science, data analytics tool out there uh, is Excel. So good old Excel. And uh, there's many the, the data, data analysts and, and, and data scientists has earned their crust by just using Excel. Uh, and it's the most widely used tool, I think, of any data analyst uh, in the world. Um, and in fact, another thing you'll probably notice as well and is a lot of the times you find that it's only the, the much bigger customers, uh, maybe companies that have been built in the internet, like the Facebooks and the Twitters and the Amazons, those people who have got internet generated data, they will have massive data sets and who want, who want to run analytics at the lowest level of granularity, they will need to be in the data lake range. But a lot of other companies don't necessarily need that. Focusing on the business question, what is the key business question? What is the key KPI? What is the pain? You know, where do you have pain? And as a startup, you know, um, there's, there's lots of pain points. Um, they may not be answerable with data. Um, I think, um, I think collaborating is very important though. So um, I mentioned Crest Solutions there. I do a lot of collaborative work with them. Um, I've done a lot of collaborative work with lots of different companies. So I think, you know, if you don't have the skills uh, and you don't necessarily have a data lake, certainly building a strategy is important. Right? So building a strategy is almost like doing that gap analysis. Now, understanding your maturity level, you know, where, uh, uh, and, and under, the understanding of the maturity level comes from understanding where your business is at and answering the questions about where the business is going. And then maybe understanding the gaps of where you're at right now, where the business is going and what you need to fill. And uh, if you're an SME um, or, or uh, you know, a small company, you know, you can fill a lot of gaps by, and, and there's a lot, I mean, from a technology perspective, um, a lot of the cloud uh, providers now provide a lot of really good, strong tools for not much money. Um, so Microsoft, uh, Power BI is a great, great, great tool. Uh, Tipco, Tipco is a great product as well. Tipco Spotfire, really great product. Again, not that expensive. Uh, and the cloud uh, access, so very little sort of uh, footprint of installation in your own environment. Uh, so you can get up and running with quite sophisticated tools quite quickly. And then the other side of it is, you know, I would say reach out to other companies that may be able to fill gaps. And so we've won quite a lot of work where uh, we've been brought in as either project management expertise or data science expertise, or, you know, try to evaluate our overall data architecture to see where the gaps are um, and take it step by step. You know, understand where you're at, understand where you want to go to and understand what you need to do to get there. Gotcha. Um, very good. So, you can't beat a good spreadsheet. That's that's the starting point. Absolutely. Um, and we're we have a very quiet audience. We've still a big dial in here. We they're very quiet. Uh, Dave, you've obviously answered all their questions. Um, just I suppose, and you touched on it in one of your slides in terms of skills, um, upskilling the in the whole area of data analytics, and you uh, referenced your your course there, your data literacy course as well. Um, what's your advice on, on skills, you know, in general, um, is, and, and is, is now a good time to look at upskilling your workforce in data analytics skills? I mean, I think yes, not just because I have the perfect course for you, um, but I think, 
I mean, all, every, all, all of the industry watchers are saying this, you know, is that there is, there is going to be more and more and more data generated uh, by devices, IoT devices, whatever devices it is. And there's no longer, uh, a, there's no longer, you can no longer actually, in a lot of instances, rely on Excel, <laughs> uh, funnily enough, um, or rely on that sort of um, subject matter expertise, that sort of, you know, oh, I think, uh, uh, you know, point in the air, I think it's this, right? Because there's just too much data there. And the people, the companies who actually get the analysis of their data, the data that they have access to, and it may not be internal, it may be external data. The people who actually get that, they will be the people. And I think there's a lot of different studies, and I, I talked through some of this in, in the training course as well, from McKinsey, the people who get that right, who get the business skills, the data skills, uh, and the data analytic skills right, that they get that right, they are moving, they are able to make better decisions to grab market share, to uh, increase, decrease their costs, so ultimately be able to make more money and actually survive. So it's, it, the, the, the skill, it's not, it's, it, it's a competitive differentiator now for companies right across everywhere because there's so much data there, because it can't be analyzed itself, you know, by just, you know, finger in the air, you know, oh, I've been doing this for 20 years, so I know that the answer is here. You may know it, but you may not know the other places where the answers are, right? So as a business analyst, you know, you would expect people who, who know the business to really know, well, they'll be able to figure out the causation versus correlation, right? Which is an important concept in, in data analytics. You know, variables might be correlated, but they're not called, one isn't causing the other. But they won't be able to identify, you know, those two or three variables that maybe they didn't think of that are hidden deep in the mass of data that you need data science skills or data literacy skills to help you identify and find. They won't be able to find those. So that's, so that's sort of, it's, 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 that's why I think a lot of the industry uh, observers are saying why data science is, and data literacy um, is such an important capability that organizations need to get better at. Okay, excellent. Um, just just a few minutes to wrap up. Uh, maybe one final question. Your best example, best company, best best use of data. Um, you know, who's your? Do you think is 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 really the best in class? Um, obviously, you have all the big tech companies there, and they they they're they're living and breathing data. You know, so your Microsoft, your Googles, your Amazons. You know, they're all very, very good in terms of the, the, uh, the analytics that they do. Uh, I remember uh, being asked this question before at a client meeting. Um, and I have to say that one of the best organizations and an Irish organization that uses data effectively uh, in the country are the Revenue Commission. Um, now, that, <laughs> that probably might, might not be that unsurprising um, but they've, they've won various awards at the Department of the Taoiseach. Um, and even, uh, I remember when I was working in EMC, they were far ahead of any uh, Irish organization that's, um, that, I, that, that I'd, I'd come in contact with or presented to uh, in terms of their use of analytics, their understanding of analytics. They had senior statisticians in there. Um, they were really good from that perspective. So, so public sector is, is, is actually quite good uh, in terms of the analysis usage. But um, uh, now revenue commissioners, they're not client of mine. Uh, my general uh, modus operandi is I don't mention any customers. And that's something that we do as, as just part of what we do with Clark Analytics. We don't generally mention any customer names. But if you were to bring up one, and, and, and I would imagine the revenue commissioners won't mind me name dropping them. Uh, they're, as I said, they're not a customer of mine. But if I was to pick one particular customer, it will probably, uh, or potential customer, they may be calling me now. <laughs> that might be for other reasons, Dave. <laughs> they know I'm talking about them. But that's one. Um, um, but I think I, I've seen, I've seen com other various other companies in lots of different, of the different industries I mentioned are all 
certainly building their data literacy capability. And I'm sure they manage their data pretty pretty well as well. Absolutely. Um, Dave, we've got a jump. We've got our next uh, and final um, webinar of, of the week on in half an hour. So listen, thanks a million for your time. Um, super informative. As I said, we'll be making this uh, recording available on our YouTube channel in, in a week or so. So really appreciate your time. Um, and thanks for everyone that dialed in. Um, so we'll chat to you all later. Perfect. Thanks. Excellent. Good, good again, folks. Cheers. Thanks. Bye-bye.